Thank you very much. Um, we really appreciate uh, you coming to uh, listen and learn of what we have. As uh, Dr. Harris mentioned, I'm Henry Sintim, fairly new. I'm originally from Ghana uh, and came to the U.S. Uh, somewhere in 2013, did my master's at the University of Wyoming, uh, and then my Ph.D. at Washington State University. So um, I would be talking briefly, as uh, Dr. Harris mentioned, um, some of the trends that we've been seeing. Um, so please don't hold me on that. So the first uh, is, um, this is basically the soil samples that were taken to the UGA soil test lab in Athens. I know um, there is a lot of people that send samples to other com uh, commercial laboratories, but the idea of this is just to give us a general trend. So I'm not, this is not uh, gonna be like the total for the state of Georgia, but it's a trend. And um, you can see, I'm looking at, a sample size that is close to 20,000 so um, for the high one so it just to let you know that I'm deriving my conclusions from a big sample size so it's, it's fairly a valid conclusion and so as you can see over the years um, this is from 2003 we, we had a steady increase and then a decline um, it looks like we might be picking up and these are soil samples that were sent to the EGA lab with cotton indicated as the crop of intention. So just to have that idea. And uh, it's quite a, a decent number. So what are we seeing? Um, what well, we can see, the red line, as you can see, represents cotton that the grower intended for 750 pounds per acre yield go. And, uh, and so you have all that yield go and uh, 1,500, which is basically Three bushels. Two bills. Uh, sorry, two bills. I'm sorry. Three I'm still bills. thinking of bushels, bushels and corn. So bills. Sorry on that. So um, it looks like right from 2003, and um, we had the thousand pounds per acre, kind of the dominant. But the trend is changing. Is so that it's gradually declining. And uh, the 750, which was kind of, uh, it's more representative of a dryland condition. And you can see that that is also pretty much stable. But interestingly, we see the 1,250 and 1,500 trend kind of shooting up to the point that last year, they out, uh, the, the, that was even more than the um, 1,000 that had been the trend for most years. So it looks like most growers um, are shooting for high uh, con, uh, cotton yield go, which, which is, is going to tie in with what uh, Dr. Harris has to say briefly after I'm through. So I think it's, it's an interesting thing, um, and uh, that the, the data that follows, I, I, I think you would, you would be excited to see what the data is pointed to. But overall, yes, um, goers are shooting for higher and higher yield go in cotton. So this um, slide shows the, all the soil test samples that were taken to the UGA lab, and this represents about 10,370 samples that were sent. And I kind of, uh, it's, I'm trying to show where we fell at. Most of these samples represent the pre-planting soil condition. And you can see that um, it looks like um, we don't have quite a lot of samples that uh, so within, you can see the colors, let me explain the slide briefly. The colors, the red, blue, green, and black, represents the classification. And that classification, I must um, clarify that is based on the UGA, so uh, the lab recommendation. And these are the uh, indicators here. So you can infer from low, medium, high, and very high. Now, what we are finding is that, I think um, as far as phosphorus goes, we, we kind of, uh, you can see that we, the, most of the samples that were sent per, within the, uh, each classification, right, per where the yield go that is intended. So let's say already we know that many people are not shooting for the 750 or let's say the dry land, but for the 1,000 um, and 1,250 and 1,005, you can see that the medium and the high, it's, it's dominating. It looks like 
we don't really have a, an issue when it comes to phosphorus. Um, and, and as we can expect that, right, because many would use poultry litter and, and stuff like that, that that helps to accumulate a pee. And I think I was a little bit worried whether it, that is going to be too high, but um, not, not, not so many growers. It, it might be a little bit when you shoot for the... Um, 1,250, 1,500, meaning there is more aggression in the management practices. It could be that there is a lot of poultry leader application and that, that is probably kicking that very high P in the high range. So the same trend, but um, it looks good when it comes to uh, as in, uh, potassium. And I must say, uh, this year, one of the common diagnoses that was, uh, we would observe was potassium deficiency. So I really wanted to point this out. And um, again, following that same interpretation as I did, this is the classification bit that UGA recommend. And uh, you can see that it's always in the medium range, always kind of in the medium range. And I think what is really happening is that most growers look at it, oh, medium range, I'm fine, and probably f decide not to uh, apply any K. And, and that heads them down the line the growing season. Because uh, like I said, this year, um, I think Dr. Harris is similar to you too. Okay, so when you get caught upon the first indication that comes up was the potassium. And I know Dr. Harris this year is going to do a lot of potassium uh, work in cutting. So just, just to let you know, it's, it looks good. You say, oh, medium looks good, but please follow the recommendation and apply that supplemental amount that you need because the medium level here won't carry you to the end of the season. And if you decide to save money now, you end up paying for it later down the season. Okay, so this is something that um, I, I felt it I, I revealing and I want to really point, highlight on. So the next one, I'll go to the USDA NAS uh, yield trend. Um, it's just to show that we, we really uh, have to start thinking about how to move our yield goals. This shows the yield, uh, the average yield over the years from 2001 to last year, 2019 and the different colors, I try to uh, see how Georgia is performing relative to all the neighboring states. And so we have Alabama, Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, and Tennessee. And this Georgia is the green line. And overall, you can see that it looks like for the past um, 10 years, if I would say, maybe we had a peak here and uh, all of a sudden we are kind of declined but overall you can see that our yield, our yield average yield is is fairly flat fairly flat and um, i know glenn is really pushing to he said he's going to work a lot of cotton and come up with recommendations that we would be able to push that yield go further and we know that uh, we would have to also consider all the economic implications to make sure we make the appropriate recommendation. All right, this is the uh, brief uh, slide that I had to show. Okay. I will give hand over to um, Dr. Harris. Any questions for Henry? Because I think we got to switch mics too. Is that right? You just need to yep. yeah, do you want me to wait for any questions? Okay. Uh, yeah, that'd be good. Any questions for Henry? A couple things I'd like to point out. Um, you, show, you start out by showing the number of samples we do at UGA Lab, uh, and we, at this point, have not offered grid sampling at mm -hmm. our UGA Lab um, in Athens, uh, but we are working on it. That's one thing Henry and I are working. We have a new director of the lab up there, and we are um, going to work with them to try to get it all the way through the grids to the maps and provide that service. So that will probably make our numbers go up. Right. Um, what was the other one? Oh, the K slide was interesting. You know, there's a lot more mediums, and phosphorus was a good medium high. But, and part of that also, Henry, might be our soils just don't hold potassium mm -hmm. as well, obviously, as phosphorus. So uh, that's another, and then that's another reason we're struggling. You're exactly right. That's what we're seeing uh, uh, there. And as far as the yields, uh, I don't mind Tennessee beat me, but it really makes me mad at Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to point that out. So, uh, we can't be having that. So uh, we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't Okay. Uh, any other questions for Henry? Uh, okay. okay. I got one maybe for both of you. You know, with the chicken litter and um, dairies and all this other stuff, is there a problem that will help the soil release the phosphate? 
dry in there that we can get start to be utilized by the plant? That's a great question. Um, there have been products that have attempted to do that, but um, and, and since phosphorus is not a big issue, I have not worked as much on phosphorus as other things, and maybe with Henry now we can, okay. the two of us will be able to do more of that work. And I, but I have not found a product that has really... Yeah. Um, claim, but yeah, I right. I know of this avail, avail that was recommended, but it's not consistent. I mean, some people say they see effects, some no. So yeah, we, you know, and really high phosphorus in the soil is not an agronomic problem. We can yeah. grow crops all day long with high phosphorus, but it, but if it gets high enough, it gets to be an environmental problem. And, and like Henry said, he, I, I'm like him. I'm kind of glad that the, the, the trend wasn't higher for having a lot of samples in the high phosphorus. Well, I think the customer or the farmer is just more or less seeing, seeing that high level. Yep. Why can't I mine it? Yep. You know, cut the cost down. But really, and yeah. phosphorus being immobile in the soil, really about the only way you can you can you got to crop it down. Right. And the only way really is to physically remove it. So then you look at crops that remove the most material, and you're thinking of things like corn silage um, and hay. You know, those are the things that really would take it off the most. Right. Um, really, our row cropping doesn't really remove that much phosphorus. So, good question. Um, that's something we got to watch out for. All right. Any other questions for Henry? All right. Good deal. Okay. Thanks, Henry. Mm -hmm. and I'll Thank you. He's going to switch us. Well, I'll, I'll switch this. Right. Perfect. Does this mean I'm not allowed to cuss? Is that what? <laughs> Can you beep it out? Is there a two second delay? I'll try to behave. Dr. Roberts, where'd he go? The wrong remote. That won't work. Hey, Bowen. All right. Um, appreciate y'all coming. Uh, we got the, we did the peanut farm show and the corn short course, and now, now we get to do cotton. Um, probably one of my more favorite ones to talk about. Um, Henry just showed you um, the percentage of samples, at least that come through our lab where they're shooting for different yield goals. And uh, right now, as he showed you, uh, our recommendations go up to three bale or 1,500 pound. Um, but last couple of years, I've had people say, I'm making four bale in spots. And how much fertilizer does it take for four bale? And that's a good question. Um, we actually have research. Um, if you look back at the history of this thing, you probably heard me say it before. Uh, I started here in 1994 in Tifton. At that time, that was before transgenic cottons. And UGA had one recommendation and one yield goal. It was 750 pound of lint, so that, that bale and a half. And it was 60 pounds of N and whatever phosphorus, uh, you know, for that, for that amount. And what we did is transgenics came along. All of a sudden, we started making three bale cotton. And I give a lot of credit to the county agents. A lot of them said, hey, we're making three bale cotton there. That must take more fertilizer. So we actually did on-farm and experiment station research. And that's when we implemented the, the system for bale and a half, two, uh, two and a half, and three bale cotton. Um, I don't like always to talk a lot about fertilizing by removal. Uh, some people do because um, you got to take account what's in the in the soil, especially for P and K. But I will tell you that those recommendations were actually started on by my predecessor before I left, and they are kind of based on removal. And and basically the the big thing to know is that for each of those half bale steps that we that we recommend for yield goal, it's a 15 pound to end difference. So if you start with 60 for bale and a half, that means three bale is 105 pounds to end. And there's some people that don't think you can make three bale cotton on 105 pounds, and you can. Um, but you might need a little more sometime if you're battling some things and feeding some weeds or battling some in, uh, herbicide injury, or et cetera. But anywhere in that probably that 100 pound range, you should make decent yields. But but what about four bale? And uh, so um, you know, at this point, before we did the research, the answer was 
you know how much to take for four bale? We'll just fertilize for three bale and put a little more, all right? Um, I like that recommendation. And actually, that's, that's really what the recommendation is, but we got to put a number on it, and that's what we're going to do. So, um, and you might have seen this before, and, and it's kind of interesting to me because it, it actually it made me think about this thing a little differently, and, and Henry kind of alluded to that somewhat. But I got, um, had five sites in both 2017 and 2018, and um, I had a slide somewhere which shows you how much N, P, and K we actually put on because uh, most of these were medium test in P and K soils. Um, but basically, when you fertilize with N, P, and K for the yield goals here, um, this is how the yields turned out. And two things about this graph stand out right away. Number one is, is there was a pretty big difference in the overall yields at those locations. These were all irrigated, and it's all the same variety. Um, but just we do better at some sites than other. This is a, a field across the street, kind of our brag patch, if you will. And you notice we're up there. Um, you know, up there in that, that three and a half bale region. Um, the next one's Sunbelt Expo Moultrie. And then the next one here is Stripling Irrigation Park. And then Lang Farm this, that year, I had white flies and didn't control them. And then out of Polgus, we planted and then we had a, a big rain over a, a weekend after planting and it washed it all down the hill and we had to replant. So, you know, when you fertilize for four bale, and you're only making a bale, you're saying, boy, I probably lost a lot of money, fertilizer, right? right? But remember that when we look at the numbers. The other thing is, again, these aren't large steps. We're not, we're not putting a lot more fertilizer on between each of these steps. 15 pounds of N, maybe 10 pounds of P and K. So I was, was kind of surprised by the overall trend up. It's not super clean, but you definitely would rather be up here than down here at all these sites. So that's what happened in 2017. This is 2018, similar data. We actually made close to four bale at the, at the site across the street. Expo again at three bale, uh, but now Lang Farm, we made a little better, made up near two bale. Out of Pogus, we struggled again. And then what happened to Stripling Irrigation Park in Camilla? It was literally zeroed out. That was the hurricane year, Hurricane Michael. It was, it was defoliated, ready to pick when Hurricane Michael came and it was on the ground. Um, one of my other colleagues tried to pick his research plots up off the ground and weigh it, and that didn't work so well. He said, I only had about half the cotton I thought I would have. I said, yeah, the other half's down the road somewhere in the woods. I don't know where it is. So anyway, I did not make my technician, by the way. Lindsey McDonald's my technician, uh, really runs my research program, does a great job. Uh, I did not make her pick up any cotton off the ground. We actually tried. We tried. Yeah, we tried to go. We went back a few days later. And I don't know if you remember after Hurricane Michael, it, it, it got sunny and we had a little more rain and sun come out. It was like 80 degrees. And by the time we went out, we thought, well, maybe we need to do a little checking. It, it had sprouted and was anchored to the ground. So we couldn't. It was a mess. We couldn't get it up off the ground anyway. So um, anyway. But if you... If you take those nine site years, we call them, and average them, this is the line for the average. And you know how averages go. Um, but I think it's kind of interesting. I'm not sure what happened right here. It's not a, what's going on between this step. Um, but here's the interesting thing. And I'm not an economist, but, and I've done this with corn too. Um, you know, because corn, we're fertilizing for 300 bushel, and is that economical or not? But basically what you have is between each of those half bale steps, remember we're putting a little more fertilizer on, how much more cotton you make, how many more pounds. So for example, from going from two and a half to three bale, we made 160 more pounds of lint. And by the way, these are machine picked and run through our microgen, so they're accurate turnouts and yields. Um, 116 pound of lint at 70 cents, that'd be worth $81. We spent $9.10 more fertilizer between two and a half, three bale. So if you if you do the math, we were on the plus side of $72 per acre. I think that's pretty good. In fact, you look up at this end, we're still gaining, even going from three to three and a half, and we kind of level off above three and a half bale. So on average, you know, if you look at that, you say, well, maybe we should have fertilized for three and a half bale. And let's be honest too, there are probably a lot of growers, they're probably already up in this region. Because um, you know, that's, uh, what, um, well, for four bale, it's 135 pound to end. I really don't get anywhere. You're around 100, 
even between 100 and 120, I would say you're in a good region for total N um, for making good yields. And if, you, and if you don't make the yields, it's probably something else that held you back. So it kind of made me look at this data a little differently, though, when you think about it. Because when we first implemented this system, you know, we had precision ag in mind and this grid sampling, and we're thinking, okay, you got spots in your fields that are weak, that only make two bale, only fertilize for two bale, and cut your losses. But actually, if you look at this data, it almost says, you know, fertilize for three and a half bale, and even if you don't make three and a half bale, you're still going to make enough more cotton to pay for itself. So it really made me look at this a little different. Henry, I don't know how we handle that extension-wise. Uh, people get a little nervous when you only have one recommendation for everything, and you say it works for everything. But, but you know, and I got to be honest too. You know, at that time we were thinking, okay, cut your losses on the weak areas. I had people saying, no, I got to push those weak areas because I got to grow some stalk on cotton. If I don't make stalk, I'm not going to make cotton. Then I'm going to push them. And and the thought was that wasn't going to be economical. But if you just look at this simple return on investment calculation, um, maybe, it, maybe it is economical to push those weak spots. So any questions on that? I think it's interesting data. Um, you know, you hear all the time that, you know, university recommendations were made in the 70s and nobody's checking them and new varieties need fer more fertilizer and everything. And I, and I don't know if that's fair. Uh, for one thing, you know, these recommendations were put into place in the mid-90s and we are checking them and trying to figure out uh, where we need to be. And we are also saying, hey, yeah, we, we recognize this trend. So right now, technically our official still ends at three bale, um, but we get enough data like this, we might put in recommendations for three and a half and four. Yeah, Tim. I didn't catch it. Were all of these irrigated? They are, they were all irrigated, yep. Okay, so they're Dry land, yeah, and that's the other thing. We, we assumed, uh, when we put these recommendations into place, we, we assumed that anything above a thousand pound yield goal assumed irrigation is what we did. But you know, I, I did a meeting last night with Wes Porter and he can show you, you know, of course on dry land field, you get a lot of rain, it do just as good as an irrigated field. So I'm not sure how to handle that either, you know. That's what I don't as a farmer, I don't know whether. I know, you don't know what kind of year, if you, if you knew what kind of year you're gonna get, if you're gonna get a bunch of rain, you'd, you'd, you'd fertilize it like irrigated. And if you knew you weren't, you'd fertilize it like dry land. But I mean, if I were you, I mean, and, you know, the other thing, too, is, um, and I'm going to talk a little about it. We, we were asked uh, uh, one time, you know, where in, our, where in our areas do we think we're, you know, getting tripped up or having problems with and everything. And, and the more I think about it, uh, the ability in, in, in making decisions and doing in-season adjustments, um, that's probably where we can probably try to focus a little more on. And, and uh, you know, if Henry, Henry and I can do anything that way, but, you know, we already split nitrogen applications, you know, so, you know, can you bump it up, bump it down, depending on what kind of weather you're getting at the time. Of course, we want to side, we want to side dress by first bloom, and then you don't know what's going to happen after first bloom either, so. But you got foliar, too, and we'll talk a little about foliar fertilizing. That's another thing, an in-season adjustment you can do. Good question. Any others on that? Um, real quickly, I do research extension and teaching. Um, this is a list of um, uh, small plot or uh, experiment station type research we did. I'm going to share, if we have time, a little on end rate. Um, you, think, you think we got end rate figured out right, but we got a little twist. We did it on conventional strip till. Uh, I continue to look at nitrogen sources for both cotton and peanut, or cotton and corn. Um, we got some company trials in here looking at different products. And then uh, one I wanted to mention, I've been mentioning everywhere, it's kind of interesting to me. It's an experimental stage, uh, but there's a product they're going to, I think they're going to call it Poltash. And what it is, it's an incinerated chicken litter. All right, so they're taking chicken litter and they're burning it for fuel, and it's the ash that's left over. And the interesting thing, um, on average, the samples we run at UGA Lab for chicken litter, they're coming out about a 333 NP and K. Um, when you burn chicken litter, it actually burns all the nitrogen off and it burns the carbon from the, you know, like the wood shavings or the, that are in the, in the litter. But it actually comes out to be about a 0812. So it's more concentrated in both, you know, phosphorus and, and, and really potassium. And as you know, muriate of potash is 0060. So this adds 12%. So we, the first year trial we did, uh, we did it on cotton and peanuts. Looked pretty good. I don't think it's gonna be any better than potash. Um, they said it wouldn't smell 
and uh, apparently if, if, if it's probably an open pile, it won't, but they delivered it to us in um, five gallon buckets that were closed. And uh, the first two we were doing fine, and then the third bucket almost knocked, uh, knocked us over with the smell. So, and uh, Bowen Simmons is my student worker too. I think you were there that day. Uh, it had that ammonia smell, you know. So I don't know what happened. I need to talk to them. I really want to go see the plant. I don't even know what their, the industry they're, they're, you know, what they're generating energy for. So I need to get, find out more about it. But I do have a complete analysis on it. Um, but but zero eight twelve. So. It's fine black powder, so I don't know how they're going to handle it as far as spreading it, what they're going to do there either. At uh, a meeting last night, a guy said, well, maybe you can fill the fertilizer truck up and then put this stuff on top. That didn't sound right to me, but um, I guess let it filter down. It would come out the back. I don't know. Um, and if you put it in a blender, everything's going to turn because it's a black ash. So, Charlie, I don't know if you want to turn your whole facility. <laughs> Maybe they're going to pellet or something. I don't know. Anyway, all right. Um, before we get into some more data, too, um, quickly, uh, fertilizer prices. I've been tracking them since 2008, NP and K separately. Um, obviously, they came down and bounced around since 2008. Supposedly, they're, 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 uh, they're steady right now, and they're not supposed to go up by the time you plant cotton. And right now, if you do our budgets with our economists on the crop comparison sheets, um, they are using 50 cents per pound to N. 40 for P2O5 and 35 for K2O. Um, P and K are pretty steady. We base that on MAP or DAP for P and Murate of Potash for K. Nitrogen, there might be some differences depending on if you're looking like ammonium nitrate or urea or 18 or 28 or whatever. So uh, keep that in mind. So uh, if you came to the Peanut Farm Show, we were tasked, all the specialists were tasked in our areas, you know, where are spots we're making mistakes? And I think we decided that wasn't probably the best way to put it. Um, I like to think of it as where do we have problems or where are areas we can get tripped up and, and, and where fertility will be kind of your limiting factor for making yield or money or whatever. And really it made me think of these strategies that I had for all the crops. And we don't need to go through every step. But they all start with soil testing and then with tissue and, and uh, sampling and foliar feeding. Um, but you can probably get tripped up in almost any of those steps. But based on county agent calls, et cetera, um, Henry already mentioned one of them. If I had to pick one nutrient, it would be potassium. But if I had to pick on one issue overall for all the crops, including cotton, it'd probably be pH. We still get a lot of questions and problems with pH. Normally it's low pH, but we actually started getting some problems with high pH and high calcium levels. Um, so that's something kind of new that we're trying to figure out. And, and, and guess what? Guess what a high calcium level can lead to? It can make that potassium problem even worse. So the problem we're already having. So you can look at any of these and, and figure that out. Soil testing in itself is kind of interesting. Um, Henry showed a data where kind of the P and K levels are. Um, I don't know if you knew this or not, but right in our recommendations, it says to maintain your P and K at a, a medium or high. Well, which is it, right? And I say, I, I, I like a high medium. How's that? That sound right? Yeah. So, so um, I like it to be right around in that in that region there, and that's what we're talking about for phosphorus. You know, a lot of times it will get into the high, but a lot of times potassium, even doing a really good job, it's going to be floating right around there in that in that kind of high medium level, not necessarily high. But you know, the whole idea is not to run these levels real low and need a bunch of fertilizer, or real high and not need any fertilizer. The idea is to maintain these at decent levels and then supplement it. And if you look at this for, for three bale cotton with these levels, which are not, wouldn't be super uncommon, 105 pounds of N, only 30 pounds of, of phosphate, and 40 of P2O5. And again, we've tested these recommendations and, and, and think they're, you know, know they're sound. Um, but one thing, I, I don't want to harp on this too much, and I might have, you see, might have seen me talk about it a little before. Um, it did, that was the other thing I was thinking when Henry showed those slides for the levels and, and where we call low, medium, and high. We are using Malik 1 extractant for P and K. And then, you know, those levels, that's UGA levels, they might not be the same as private lab levels. What we call, um, you know, medium, they might call low, for example. So you got to be careful. Um, but one thing, too, is that we've always used this Malik 1 extractant. Um, it's a weak acid because our soils are basically weak. 
in terms of especially clay and organic matter. But Florida is going to Malik 3. And their soils aren't any better than ours as far as I know. You cross that line, they're just as sandy. Some of them might even be sandier. Um, and Malik 3 is a stronger extractant. And if you follow my logic here, basically, you know, they're, they're saying use Malik 3, and they're going to probably say use less phosphorus. But they're basically saying that means that, that means, or what we've been doing all these years, Malik 1 is wrong. And I don't agree with that. Um, number one, Malik 1, I still say, is the appropriate extractant for us. And that's what all of our research data is based on. They don't have the data that I know of tested Malik 3 to show that when they put less phosphorus on, they're not going to hurt yields. And that's, so that's what I think. And, and, and depending on who you talk to, but, you know, it looks like they did it for environmental reasons, especially the phosphorus issue. So, um, you know, and I've even, and, and also there's incentive money for folks in Florida to run Malik 3. There are rumors that they'll run them for Malik 3, get the money, and then call the lab later on and say, hey, by the way, what would it be for Malik 1? Think about that. You always find a loophole. Um, anyway, we don't have any plans to change to Malik 3 at this point at UGA lab that I know. So, any questions on that? What about pH? Um, you see spots in your field that are weak like this, you know, probably the first two things you should think of are either pH or nematodes. And I can tell you this is pH because it's from a long-term pH trial. Um, probably got a pH of about 5.0 there. Surprised the cotton's not dead. And probably 6.0 here where it looks better. Um, so, but it, re it reminds me to go back Remember at the list, I had soil testing MPH. What about grid sampling? How many you know, people are grid sampling? I've been asking at meetings. It looks like we got more and more all the time. And uh, I wasn't ne necessarily sold that much on grid sampling when it first came out, because especially we thought, oh, we'll level off the P and K and everything. We'll make great yields and all that. But, I, but you know, I shouldn't have been surprised about this, but grid sampling and variable rate lime applications alone are really, really important. So it's not an official recommendation yet, but I'm going to talk with Wes Porter and George Vlees and all that, and, we, and, and Henry, you know, we might want to make that an official recommendation because it's usually, these spots usually aren't in the whole field, as you know, they're usually in weak areas again. And, uh, you know, variable rate, grid sample variable, variable rate lime can really take care of a lot of this issue I think we're seeing. So. Some people say it pays for itself and more. I'm not an economist, I don't know, but I, but I do agree that pH is super important uh, to crop growth. Another thing that's hard to nail down, but I'm, I'm kind of convinced of, is that if you don't grid sample, and let's say you're taking just some general so samples for the whole field, and you put one rate of lime all the time, I think your weak areas just get weaker and weaker and weaker over time. To the point, sometimes they don't even grow anything. They'll be bare spots. So, so again, variable rate, grid sample and variable rate lime should pick that up. Any questions on that? And while you're at it, we can variable rate P and K too. Haven't quite figured out how to do nitrogen and micronutrients yet, but we're working on it. Probably more on the nitrogen side than the, than the micronutrients. Good thing about micronutrients, we can spray those if we have to. We don't, you don't need large amounts when you spray them. But nitrogen would be very helpful if we can figure that out. Um, I get more questions on pH than anything, and we can talk about it some more, what, you know, why you know, pH goes down. There's some natural effects, but nitrogen fertilizers is really the, the main one that, that we do that brings nitrogen or uh, pH down. Um, also, we can talk about what happens when you lime a field. And a lot of people think it's the calcium in lime, but it's not. It's the carbonate. Uh, this graph is from a soil fertility manual, and I, this is something I try to do in class because it doesn't show the intermediate step where the hydrogens, which of course are responsible for the pH, will actually combine with the carbonate, and that's what's really um, taking care of your, your pH problem. Uh, what about dolomitic calcic? I get that question a lot. We need to update this slide, but for a while there, we used to, you know, dolomitic lime is a good cheap source of magnesium. But it was going down and calcitic was coming up. I think it's kind of leveled off a little. Um, and again, the difference, dolomitic has magnesium, calcitic does not. 
Um, so the next question I usually get is, well, you know, can I go to calcitic? If you've got good magnesium levels, you know, you can go to calcitic for a while. Keep soil testing to check your magnesium levels. But if you're anywhere, you know, between, I don't get nervous until, you know, you get below 60 or so on, on magnesium. So um, just keep that in mind. Um, another thing with soil testing pH that might get us tripped up is that um, if you didn't know, if you measure your pH in water, which most labs do, so they just take a scoop of soil and, a, and, and the equivalent amount of water, mix it up and put that probe in there, that pH will vary over time during the year naturally. And it has to do with the salts in the soil. And what you'll notice, these are two different soils. One was started out a little higher than the other as far as pH. Nothing was done to them in terms of lime or, or nitrogen fertilizers and they were sampled every month. And what you notice is on pH, you're, you're lowest in the, in the fall and you actually come up this time of year already a lot higher. And again, it has to do with this time of year. We've had a lot of rain. We don't have a crop growing out there. It leaches the, the salts out. So when they actually put that probe in the sample, it comes out with what we call a false high. Now, normally I don't think this is a huge problem, but once in a while I'll get calls and they said, I had a pH of 6.0 last year. I didn't lime. I took my soil sample and was wet. Now I have a 7.0. That's a red flag. Number one, pHs probably don't go more than about a half point up or down with what we do a lot of times in a year. And the other thing is if you sampled when it was wet, those salts probably leached out and that could affect the sample. By the way, it does not affect things like P and K. It's pH is the only thing we're worried about with that real wet sample. Of course, how wet's you know, too wet for a soil sample, and I tell people if water is running out of the soil sample bag, it's probably, probably too wet. So, and that happens, we get in a hurry, you know, almost running late, we gotta take a bunch of samples, and it gets wet. By the way, UGA lab, we actually went to measuring pH and salt years ago, and it kind of takes this effect out. Totally legitimate way to measure pH, and uh, we think it levels that out, takes that away, so keep that in mind. Um, I don't know how much you want to talk about cation exchange and base saturation and all that, but I, I think it is one that's kind of uh, good to think about and know. Um, and and I, I kind of like this. I use this slide for class, and I, I like to use this as kind of a challenge to see if I can explain this in about two minutes or less, <laughs> which is not easy to do, as you know. Um, and, and, you know, with a, like a lot, with a lot of things, you go back to what you know, right? And if you can keep them logically in order, uh, you, you can keep them in your mind and keep them straight. So basically, you imagine these as kind of like two different soil particles or whatever. And uh, soils have positive and, and negative charges on them, but overall they have a net negative charge. Okay? Where do those negative charges come from? They can only come from two places, clay and organic matter. All right? Now, do we have a lot of either of those in our soils in South Georgia? No. So we're going to look like this one on the right, where we're going to have low CECs. This would be an example of more of a Midwestern soil that has a lot higher clay and organic matter. By the way, not only do we, don't we have a lot of clay, but the clay we have isn't even that good. How's that? So we, kind of, kind of, we got kind of dealt a bad hand uh, when it comes to cation exchange capacity. Um, so, and this number is not a mystery either. If you want to take some of the mystery out of this stuff, you see these numbers, five would be pretty common for us. Again, 25 would be common up north. But, but basically, you can assign an actual CEC number to the clay and organic matter. And normally, the uh, organic matter is higher. The CEC of organic matter itself is, what, 150, 200 or so. Clays are maybe 50s or whatever. And if you knew your percentage of clay and organic matter in your soil, and the actual CEC of the clay and organic matter you have is all you do is multiply those out and add them together. I know at least one person had my class, she probably remembers doing that. Um, and, and it kind of takes the mystery out. I don't know, sometimes I like having a little mystery. And, anyway, um, but why is this even important? Because the more negative charge you have, that'll help hold on to positively charged things like calcium, magnesium, potassium. And if you can't hold on to those, they can actually leach out. And we just can't hold them. Another reason why we're having a hard time holding on to potassium, those levels aren't as high in our soils. 
and of course you also got eight, you know, and you can actually think about this as if this is soil particles in the solution and you put that probe in, those are the hydrogens you're measuring. We call that active acidity, that's what they're measuring. So that's kind of exchange capacity because positive charges are cations, they're holding on to negatives. Um, what about base saturation? You hear a lot about that and you hear, you know, I'm going to really concentrate on looking at my base, sat base saturation. Is all base saturation is, is of those negative charges, what, you know, what are they, what are, what are held on to those percentage wise? So if you had, if you had 100 negative charges, you know, and 70 had calciums on them, you have a base saturation, calcium 70%, that kind of thing. And that is good to look at, but everybody will tell you that you can't fertilize according to that. It's kind of like working backwards. You really just want to follow your, if you lime and fertilize, especially with potassium, according to recommendations, this kind of all takes care of itself. But if you do things like flood the soil with calcium, what are you going to do? You're going to knock a lot of these things off, and you're going to have all calciums on there, and you're probably going to have a potassium problem, that kind of thing. If you let your pH get real low, you're going to have a bunch of hydrogens there. So it makes sense. Any questions on that? All right, how are we doing time-wise, Henry? I think we're supposed to start it. i got about 10 minutes. All right, what do we want to talk about? Let's see. Oh, I, I love showing this slide. <laughs> so you, you heard about, you, you know, cover crops are kind of making a comeback. We've talked about organic matter and all that. To me, this is, this is my idea. This is soil health, organic matter wrapped up in one slide, all right? That's what you want, all right? Very simple, right? I tell my students they got to reproduce this on a test. Watch them freak out. Um, but basically, basically this is the breakdown product of having organic matter in your soil. This is about the smallest we can draw it. This is humic acid. You can buy humic acid in a jug, right? Put it out two quarts per acre. Guess what? Two quarts per acre isn't enough. And you can't afford probably to put enough out of the jug on to make a difference. And if you want to go a little further and think about it, soil organic matter is a very general term. It includes everything that's even living, and then you got uh, the dead um, plant tissue, et cetera, and then you have the stabilized um, organic matter. We call that humus. There's all kinds of terms that pop up in here you got to keep straight. A lot of people call this the living, the dead, and the, the really dead, or something like that. Um, and, uh, and, you know, you can think about it. This, you know, technically, this could be like an earthworm. This could be like gin trash. And then this is gin trash after you leave it for a year and it gets nice and stabilized and looks like black soil, okay? If you do that, we can do some chemical analysis and break it down with, with bases or whatever and separate it out by what we call human, humic acid, and fulvic acid. So that's the one I just showed you right there is humic acid. There's also fulvic acid. But my whole idea is that instead of trying to do it two quarts at a time out of a jug, is, is build your organic matter with cover crops and, and less tillage and then kind of build it and it will come and you'll get this stuff as basically as like a byproduct. So, and well, again, why is that important? Because if you look back at this, this graph, I told you negative charges are coming from clay and organic matter. And this is basically a, you know, organic matter. Everywhere you see an OH, that's a negative charge on this thing. And you got actually, if you, if you remember your chemistry, you got three different places. You got on a, on a regular carbon chain, and then you got it on a carboxyl group, and then also right directly off a ring, you have a, a phenolic group. So there's different places, but that's where your negative charges are coming from. All right, any questions on that? Clear as mud? There they are there. That's my favorite one, the alcoholic. So anyway. <laughs> Um, carbon nitrogen ratio. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. Um, where does it come into play? I guess it comes into play a lot of times. I get calls and somebody says, I'm going to build my organic matter. Instead of growing a cover crop, I'm going to put a bunch of sawdust out there. Well, if you put a bunch of sawdust and then plant corn, what's your corn going to look like? It's going to look bad. It's going to look yellow and stunted. Um, it has to do with most crops have about 50% carbon in them, 40 or 50. But the carbon nitrogen ratio, it varies on how much nitrogen in it. So a legume material, like a vetch crop, will have a good amount of nitrogen, so the, well, the carbon nitrogen ratio is low, it'll release nitrogen. 
but something like sawdust has very low nitrogen in it, so it has a very high carbon nitrogen ratio. What happens is when that high carbon material hits the ground, the microbes want to want to chew on it, but there's not enough nitrogen in that material, so they have to steal nitrogen from the soil, and that's why you have a nitrogen deficiency. So just be careful with that. All right, I'll finish with potassium deficiency real quick. Um, probably the one we worry about the most, although I don't have any silver bullets to tell you about. Really, basically, to avoid having potassium deficiency, this is on some research plots at Sunbelt Expo. This is in the field across the street from the gin in Hazelhurst, if you know where that is. Thought this was interesting. This is cotton following peanuts. And guess what? They, <coughs> they windrowed the peanut hay and bailed it off. And normally I would tell you these streaks that look good are from the nitrogen from the peanut hay, but in this case it was actually potassium, because there's potassium in that hay too. And it was flat out. This soil had such low soil test potassium and everything, it was getting a benefit from that potassium coming out of that hay. So, so it can happen. This is what a normal leaf should look like. This is what the early symptoms of potassium nitrate or potassium deficiency look like. If you let it go another month, don't do anything, it can look like this. And that's pretty severe. You probably wouldn't even be able to fix that with foliar. It's so severe and you got stemphylium leaf spot and you can spray fungicide on it. But if you've got potassium problems, you've got potassium problems. So um, that's what it looked like in the field. Um, this data was from 2009, so we probably need to update it with current varieties. Um, but basically a nice response. Our recommendation was for 135 and we made three bale. Didn't see a response of going above that for K2O. Interesting thing though is we came back to this 90 pound on the ground treatment and did foliar. And it did not take us back up to three bale, but it took us back up to we gained 250 pound of lint with some foliar. So we kind of ran out of time, don't have time to talk about foliar. Unfortunately, that's the way foliar kind of is too. This time of year, it's the furthest thing from our minds. We get out there, you plant the cotton, keep the weeds out, bugs out got a good yield and all of a sudden in July we start seeing potassium deficiency and we think about foliar so um, by the way um, the, there is a fertility section in the production guide if you haven't gotten one the red guide and get them at your county meetings um, but I try to hit a lot of stuff in here that was not in that production guide um, let me just finish oh, I had a lot of stuff in here with this one um, there are a lot of products out there we're testing trying to figure out if they work or not. They're economical. A lot of them have legitimate stuff in them, things like molybdenum sulfur. Although I don't know if cotton needs a lot of molybdenum or sulfur. But uh, be careful of, of products like this. I don't know if anybody's heard of this one. Um, this is what I call pure snake oil, okay? I shouldn't use that word, but this is an example of it. Um, there's a whole list of reasons why, and by the way, um, the guy that sells this, I don't think is in the room. And the door is all the way over there, so I messed up. Um, no lie, the, the, he suppose, supposedly he's from Mississippi and sells it on Craigslist. So that, that's a kind of a red flag in itself. I got a problem with almost all these statements they make and everything, but the biggest thing is, is they say it raises the pH, and it's calcium chloride. Calcium chloride does not raise pH. That's a problem. That's a big problem. By the way, I don't think they're targeting row crops. They're targeting cattlemen, people that are growing forages, hay, and, and, and grass right now. And it's still out there. We're trying to work with Department of Ag and get, trying to get it tracked down, but it's, it's kind of hard to do that sometimes. But just, just keep that in mind and, uh, you know, call your county agency if they've heard of it. They'll call me. I can't test them all, but I trust as many as I can, and we can try to help you out. So with that, George Cotton Commission sponsors what I do. George Plant Food, Waters Lab, et cetera. So, any questions? I think we're about out of time. Anything we missed that you think might help us? I didn't talk about split potassium. You know, we split our nitrogen, but I have not seen a lot of advantage of splitting potassium. So, in my opinion, you can put all your recommended potassium at planting or soon after. Now, some people split it, they put recommended rate of potash at planting, then he put some extra at side dress. That probably works pretty good. 
but I've actually done it where I put half my recommended potash at planting. I waited till at least first square to put my second shot out and I already had potassium deficiency. And that crop is squaring up, it's starting ready to go at that time. And I guess the theory is when people split it like that, they figure it works just like nitrogen. It does not. It's not as mobile in the soil and, and all that. So um, recommended rate of potash at planting. And then if you catch, if you think you got a problem, catch it early and do some foliar feed. All right. How many times did you put on this uh, potassium? That potassium was, I, I, I remember, I'm pretty sure it was two shots of 10 pounds of, of K power, potassium nitrate. Yep. Yep. Don't go too late either. I get a lot of questions, how late's too late. Um, anywhere in that peak blooms about fourth week of bloom, it's gonna crash its end. And you can actually, I like to hit it beforehand. And somebody said, well, what about hitting it a little after? Well, that apparently works too. So any, any but don't, just don't wait till like seventh or eighth week of bloom, it's too late. Good question. Have you seen the variation in soil samples before after you've Yeah, great question. I've been getting that question a lot lately. Um, so, you know, and you're not talking about new ground. New grounds, you take it out of trees, it's going to be low and everything. You've got to bulk it up and everything. But, but we don't do a lot deep turning as much as we used to, but a lot of times we do it before peanuts. But, but you got to be careful because our recommendations are actually set for 8-inch depth to maintain pH and good levels at 8 inches. Um, I don't know what that is. So turn me off. Um, but what can happen... If you're maintaining good levels eight inches deep and then you plow to 12 inches, you, you, you might turn up some stuff that isn't as good pH and P and K. Although you gotta be careful. One year I did that, a guy wanted to plow down to 16 inches. And I thought, oh man, you're gonna pull up some bad stuff. So I got a picture of me standing in the furrow. Pulling these, it looked like, it's called a baker plow. It looked like satellite dishes he was pulling through the field. So I, 18 inches, right? So I went zero to nine and then I went nine to 18 inches, so I had both levels. And I, I told him, I said, you're gonna pull up some bad stuff. Guess what, come back, it was all the same. And come to find out, he had been pouring lime on that sandy ground for years and years, and it had all worked its way even that deep. So, but, but, uh, but just be careful with that. Um, even lime, these new plows seem to bury it. So you put lime out there and you flip it, it buries that lime. I'd rather see you put the lime out after you turn and hire it in. It's a little harder on the fertilizer dealers, but I, I, you know, they'll do it, I think. Um, so you gotta be careful with things like that. Good question. All right. Have, yeah, uh, Charlie. What about the boron and sulfur? Are y'all looking at maybe an increase in the recommended rate? Or? Yeah, uh, <laughs> boron and sulfur. Boron, our recommendation is half pound foliar, and we're gonna probably stick with that. We think that's enough as long as you do that rate every year, you're gonna you know, maintain a little in the soil, and what you get for foliar is fine. Sulfur is an interesting one because, as you know, we're getting less sulfur out of the air because we're scrubbing the sulfur out of the smokestacks. That's the gypsum we're using, by the way. Um, so I've been doing some work on, on both cotton and corn on sulfur, and our recommendation right now is 10 pounds per acre. Um, but, you know, you go higher, you, you know, higher yield goal for both cotton and, and corn, I might want to go more like 20 pounds of sulfur. Good news is, is a lot of our nitrogen side dressing materials have sulfur in them, so it kind of balances itself out. And uh, so I would definitely recommend a side dress on, on cotton and corn that has sulfur in it. I think we got to go. I think we're out of time. Appreciate you coming. Have a good conference. We'll be around.